<clears throat> so almost every chemical synthesis experiment in origin of life research can be summed up by a protocol analogous to this. The researchers would purchase chemicals. They'd purchase them from chemical companies, generally in high purity from a chemical company. They mix those chemicals together in water at high concentrations or in a specific order with some set of carefully devised conditions. They'll obtain a mixture of compounds that have a resemblance to one or more of the basic four classes of chemicals needed for life. That's carbohydrates, nucleic acids, amino acids, and lipids. You need those four classes of compounds for life. Then they'll publish a paper making bold assertions about origin of life from these functionless, crude mixtures of stereoscrambled intermediates, much like Miller did in the Miller-Urey experiment in 1952. You engage the ever-gullible press to dial up the knob of unjustified extrapolation, watch the mesmerized layperson exclaim, you see, scientists understand how life formed, and then you encourage a generation of science textbook writers to make colorful, deceptive cartoons of raw chemicals assembling into cells, which then emerge as slithering creatures from a prehistoric pond. And that's what fills the books today. That's what students learn from. And this is exactly what happens. This is the synthesis problem. If you really wanted to make these chemicals for synthesis, molecules that compose living systems almost always show homochirality, meaning that they're one mirror image and not the other. Your left and your right hand are mirror images of each other. If you put your right hand and you look at it in the mirror, it looks like your left hand. But they're non-superimposable. You can't put a right hand on, your right hand in a left-handed glove. Almost all biological molecules are, are, are homochiral. They come in only one form. When building molecular systems, constant redesigns are needed to take the synthesis back to step one. It's often impossible to remove a moiety once it's been added to a molecule. So, think about this. Say there's a process going on where some molecules are being built up, and all of a sudden, somehow in a natural system, it's built a little bit of a wrong segment. First of all, it doesn't even know what's wrong because it doesn't even have a target that it's going to. But let's just say it knew somehow. Now, it made a mistake. What does it do? It has to go back to step one. You often can't remove the moiety once it's been put on there. And it, because it's homochiral, all these experiments are really hard to do. Synthetic reactions don't know how to stop their current course of progression or why to stop. The chemist stops the reaction and isolates the material. Nature doesn't know how to stop the reaction because it doesn't know why to stop. There's no mind there. This is a prebiotic world. This is prior to biology. Time. People say, oh, well, you have long time, billions of years. No, time, although claimed to be the great savior of abiogenesis, is actually the enemy. For example, carbohydrates are kinetic products. They caramelize. They undergo decomposition. So in other words, if a chemist is going to be making carbohydrates, which is a very hard chemistry to do, really hard chemistry to do, you have to stop the reaction, or else it goes on to other unwanted products. They're kinetic products, meaning that they're not the thermodynamically most stable products, are caramelization. They de decomposition products. A prebiotic system doesn't have the ability to purify its structures. It doesn't know how to purify it. If you don't purify your chemicals after each step, what happens is the, is the unwanted side reactions build up in there. And those consume whatever reagents there are for starting materials, and you get messes that can't be worked on. So chemists will purify after each step. You have to do that. Nature would have to do that too. There's no way around it. Nobody knows how these things were purified. Reagent order is essential. Say you're baking a cake. You have the flour, you have the eggs, and, and you say, well, uh, why don't I just add the icing now? <laughs> well, you can't do that. Well, why not? Well, because first I've got to bake this cake, then I put the icing. Exactly. There's a precise order. All of chemistry is like this. How does this happen, this precise order, when you have hundreds of different chemicals that have to be fed in at the right time? Oh, well, this pool spilled into that pool, and this pool millions and millions of times over and over again in exactly the right order? The parameters of temperature, pressure, solvent, light, no light, pH, atmospheric gases, no gases, have to be carefully controlled in order to build a complex molecular structure. Characterization at each step has to be done. A chemist has to stop and characterize or else you don't know what you have. How does nature do characterization? Well, now that we have biological world, you have enzymes that check everything. And if the thing isn't right, the enzymes, other enzymes come and chop that thing back up because they don't want it contaminating it. But in a prebiotic world, before there were any enzymes, because the enzymes come from biology, 
But you have no biology in a prebiotic word. It's abiogenesis, before biology. How did, how did the characterization take place? Nobody knows. The mass transfer problem is the killer of all roots. So what do you do? You start with a kilogram of material, you go about four steps, and you're left with five milligrams of material. And so what do you do? You go back and you make more, and you bring it on through. It's called bringing up starting material from the rear. But now nature's going along and has spent 400 million years getting to this point and it ran out of starting material. Okay, well, go back and make some more. It's hard for me because I never kept a laboratory notebook. I don't know what I did. <laughs> so this is just one little part of making the motor for those little, little motors that drill through cells and that we build into the nanocars. And so you look at all these different reactions that take place. You, you use 5 degrees and then cool it to minus 10 to minus 15, and then you go, up to minus, then you go down to minus 50 degrees, and, and you have all of these temperature controls, and then you, here you're using 130 degrees and 60 degrees. Well, why do we use all these different temperatures? Oh, do we just like cooling things and heating things? No, you have to, or the chemistry doesn't work. Nature would have to do the same thing. Nobody knows how. There's precise orders in doing things. So this is just one reaction, just one step of the reaction of, of what you have to do. You, you, so, so you put in a cooling bath at minus 15 degrees centigrade to minus 10 for 1.5 hours. After this period, the reaction mixture was cooled to minus 50 and then transferred to a strength for All of this for one little step. And then you have to... So how does this happen? Nobody knows. None of the biological experiments that people have done when they say they've, they, they've created life, they never went through any of this. They're lying. They never went through any of this. They have no idea how nature could have done this. And then you have to characterize it. So we use a tool called nuclear magnetic resonance, and we characterize it. And so just looking at this one molecule, we break down these structures and we characterize it. Well, how do we describe to the world so that they can see that we know what we're doing? So we write this up. And here it is, a combination of synth. And so this is the write-up. But that's only part one. There is part two to this. So there's the other part. All right, so you have to do this to convince your colleagues that you got what you say you got. Every biological system has to do a characterization, whatever the tool you use, but it's complex. For this paper on the nanocars, it had 281 supplemental pages just talking about how we characterized it to prove that we got what we got. You have no idea how this happened in nature. Remember, there's no brains yet. It's an abiological world. This is prebiotic, origin of life. Nobody has ever explained this. Nobody. So you, you put this, we make this nano car. The first nano car we made with the motor in it had this motor. And this motor would spin when you shine light on it. But it would spin at 1.8 revolutions per hour. It's kind of slow. But then when we pulled out this sulfur atom and closed this down to a five-member ring, then it's going three million rotations per second. So small changes at this level have a big effect. So what do we do? Oh, well, you just erase that sulfur atom, and then you go across to there. But you can't do that in real. That took us back to step one in the synthesis. But again, it took us a billion years to get here in nature. How do you go back to here? Oh, I don't know. Nobody knows how you... And this is trivial compared to nature's complex systems. This is trivial compared to what you do with biological systems. This is silliness in comparison. <clears throat> then once you deal with the synthesis, which you can't deal with, because you have to make the four classes of compounds, which nobody else has, has ever made ab initio from the beginning, starting in a, with prebiotic-like conditions. Even using advanced synthetic techniques, it's tough. But then you have to assemble them into a cell. So a protocell is a self-organized, endogenously ordered, spherical collection of lipids proposed as a stepping stone to the origin of life. So it's taking a lipid bilayer, and it forms a spherical system capturing water inside. So that when, when people make this, they say, hey, you know, we're, we're going toward life. Oh, are you? Okay, so once, once they make a protocell, this is... What all protocell experiments, can, assembly experiments, can be summed up as. You purchase homochiral diacetyl lipids from a chemical company, or they synthesize stereochemically scrambled lipids from small molecules. 
You add these lipids to water and observe the simple and expected thermodynamically driven assembly of those lipids into a synthetic bilayer vesicle upon agitation. And actually, you need some shear. Sometimes the researchers will add other molecules like nucleotides that get engulfed. Publish a paper claiming that the synthetic vessel is a, vesicle is a protocell suggestive of early forms of cellular life. Engage with the media to ramp up the hype. Watch the layperson be misled. Every experiment in, in, in assembly is based on this. Well, do they really have something that looks like a cell? This is what the lipid bilayer in a real cell looks like. It is filled up with entities, with proteins, with carbohydrates, all these things that are going through here. The top surface is different than the bottom surface. Every one of the protocell experiments, it's the same top and bottom. Oh, well, that doesn't matter. What's the difference? Top and bottom, same. Top and bottom, different. What's it? makes a big difference. The cell doesn't work when the top and bottom are the same. And then all the different little organelles, the different pieces within the cell, have their own constituents within the lipid bilayer. It's flooded with things on the surface that control the opening so that certain substrates can get in, other substrates can get out. It controls what gets into the cell. All of these are sophisticated nanomachines that have to be in here for this to be a cell. Researchers have identified thousands of different lipid structures in the cell membrane. When researchers make protocells, they use one. One type. There's thousands of different types in a cell. Uh, lipid bilayers surround subular organelles. Lipid bilayers have a non-symmetric dis distribution. There's protein lipid complexes. that are highly complex. Here's another one. See all these little things that are represented here? Every cell is covered with what's called glycans. These are sugars or carbohydrates that extend out over the cell. You say, what's the difference? They're all the same. No, they're all different. And it's by this that cells recognize each other. One cell comes up and bumps against another. How does it know what kind of cell it's bumping up next to? By recognizing the carbohydrates that are on the surface. This is what controls blood type, for example. So if you just, if you just consider the nucleic acids, the things that make up DNA, just consider the A base, A. If you had six A's, what's the different ways that you can hook those together? A, 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 A. Six in a row. That's the only way you can hook six together in DNA. But if you just had six D pyranoses, six, six of one type of carbohydrate, there's over one trillion constitutional and stereochemical isomers. Over one trillion ways you can hook that together. There's more information by far embedded in the carbohydrates, in the sugars, than there is in DNA. You think DNA has all this information? That's great. Well, DNA can't store nearly as much information as a carbohydrate can. Six of the same carbohydrates has one trillion combinations to hook it together. If you get it wrong, the cell doesn't work. Nobody's ever figured out how that happens. But we made a protocell, so we're sort of like going toward life, right? No, you're nowhere close. They never address this. Then there's the interactomes. This is the non-covalent interactions within a functioning cell. So if you just take the proteins in a single yeast cell, 3,000 different proteins, if you say, what's the way that these can line up next to each other in, in, in this cell for, for working? Well, it turns out that's been calculated by these, these groups from, from Belgium, Brussels, and from Johns Hopkins, and it's 10 to the 79 billion combinations. Now, how big a number is that? Well, let's compare. The, number, the estimated number of elemental particles in the universe is 10 to the 90. This is, this is 10 to the 79 billion you got to get that thing right. Nobody has any idea how that happened. And so when cells divide, they get all these ordered up and they start dividing and they never lose this order. They keep just transferring this order. Nobody knows where the first cell came from. The first cell came from. So proto-turkeys. Origin of life proto-cell assembly is akin to buying 20 pounds of sliced turkey meat, adding a gallon of turkey broth, warming, sticking in a few feathers, and suggesting that a live turkey will eventually come gobbling out if given enough time, or that a proto-turkey or an extant turkey has been synthesized. This is exactly the same thing. Who of us would be so foolish to say you, 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 you buy 20 pounds of sliced turkey meat, you throw that in, and turkey's going to come gobbling if you have enough time. It's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Time doesn't do that. That's exactly what people are saying. 